Blessed Sabbath everyone and happy Sabbath. What a blessed morning it is. I'm so excited today. Ask me why? Because we are talking about prophecy and prophecy includes talking about time. My name is Makola Malaji and my father, the late Pastor Malaji, was never late for any appointment. He was very punctual. He respected time. And coming to think of it, today we're talking about prophecy and it most definitely will talk about time. Let's pray. Our God and our Father who art in heaven, we thank you this morning for granting us an opportunity to come together for fellowship and we ask you to assist us Lord as we are about to embark in your word give us the correct guidance and the correct interpretation of scripture free our minds from evil open our hearts that we may be receptive to your word we ask all this in the wonderful name of our Lord and coming soon Savior Jesus Christ Amen come let's take a journey on lesson 11 which is the Bible and prophecy. What is the Bible? What is prophecy? The Bible is a source of life. Without the Bible, we are nothing. The Bible is an oracle of God. The Bible is the word of truth. There's no other word of truth that we believe except for the Bible. As the quarter of this lesson depicts that we only base our minds and our thoughts on solar scripture only. The Bible is the book of the Lord and also the Bible is a garden of promises. So out of these promises we are going to find prophecy and we need to believe we should be believing in prophecy. Now what is prophecy? Prophecy is a declaration of something to come. It is an unbroken sequence of events continuous from the beginning to the end now as adventists should we be believing in prophecy the answer is yes we need to believe it we need to know it's time like i alluded before that we are going to be talking about time and we also need to know whether the time has passed or it is still coming the memory text for our lesson consideration we find it in Daniel 8 verse 14 and he said unto me unto 2300 days then the century shall be cleansed now prophecy is a crucial part of our identity and mission as Adventist as I have said we have to believe it are we believing it because we need to believe it or we believe for the sake of believing? Yes, we need to believe. Why? Because we follow Christ's example. Christ believed in prophecy. And we find that in John 14 verse 29, that bears testament that God himself believed in prophecy. John 14 verse 29 read as follows. And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So in prophecy, there's an element of time. There's the beginning, there's the end. But it is a continuous event of things to come. Now, as Adventists, which method of prophecy do we follow? We follow the historic the historic method that states that prophecy is progressive it is con it is a continuous fulfillment starting from the past and ending with god's eternal kingdom when we state that jesus himself believed in prophecy as we are his followers we need to believe in prophecy and also we use an example of prophet daniel prophet daniel also used the historic view of the interpretation 
when he explained the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar, the dream that we find in Daniel 2. Here we find that Prophet Daniel uses his reliance on God. But how do we, do we really know that he used the historic method? When he said to King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold after you this and that. Those are events that we know in Daniel 2 verses 38. So Daniel laid a foundation of scripture and prophecy. It should be interpreted one after the other. Now this one after the other, meaning that we don't need to mess the chronological events. They should happen one after the other as depicted by prophecy. Now, I want us to use the example of Martin Luther and John Wesley. They believed in the historic way of prophecy and interpretation. We as current Adventists, we should also believe in this method as guided by scripture. We have already spoken about the text that bears testament that Jesus himself believed in prophecy and also prophet Daniel and also the martyrs of our faith that I have just mentioned. Historism and prophecy. Now, let's take a journey to uh, Daniel 2. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of the statue, the head of gold. We know all that. We have dealt with this lesson in the previous quarter, which was lesson 8, and we have done it extensively. So here we find that Prophet Daniel does not rely on himself. He relies on the interpretation he receives from God. And after that, he explains the dream. And he further said, what shall come to pass? Now, this statement tells us about the element of time. What shall come to pass? So there's a waiting period here. There's events that need to happen. And hence I said we need to know whether the events have passed or they are still coming. That is the understanding of, proper, of the proper explanation of the word prophecy. Now, when talking about time, we come to Daniel 7 and 8. It gives us the unbroken sequence of the four earthly kingdoms that we have dealt extensively in the previous lesson when we spoke about the four kingdoms. Now, history leads to future until Christ establishes his kingdom. Now, we are going to talk about this earthly kingdom, but we know that our main focal point is that Christ's kingdom is the kingdom that will rule for eternity. The earthly kingdoms that we are going to talk about shortly are kingdoms which will never last forever. Now, the year day principle. We are talking about time. And if we talk about time, we know that the earthly time can never be the same as the biblical time. Now, we are talking about 2,300 days principle. Now, in Ezekiel 4 verse 6, the Bible explains that when you count prophetically, you count a day to a year. So a day is equals to a year on prophetic language. Now, time can be viewed as two components. The component of chronology and the event. When the time had fully come, that is the, 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 the line found in scripture when Jesus said, when the time had fully come. Now, this tells us that the event arrived on the chronology of time. The principle explains to us the events that took place on the period of 2,300 days. And we know that the period of 2,300 days is the period of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Again, 
The calculations on prophetic terms are symbolic. They are not literal. We don't mean the 2000 calculation that we know in our human language or understanding. But the biblical way is it is a symbolic. It doesn't mean the 2000 and the 300 that you know. Again, the calculations found in prophetic terms are symbolic. They are not literal. When we look at the little horn, it is the event in the chronology. Now, when we talk about chronology, we are talking about the starting, the middle, and the ending. We don't need to say the end becomes the start and the start becomes the middle. Chronology, we move in terms of time and order of events the way they need to be happening. Now, when we look at the little horn, it is the event on the chronology. It did not come at the beginning or at the end. It came at the middle towards the end. Let's identify the little horn. Now, let's talk about the four kingdoms. The first one is the kingdom of Babylon, which is likened to a lion. Again, the lion is symbolic. That's when we talk about tripology. We are saying Babylon is a kingdom, but it is likened to a lion. And the second kingdom is the kingdom of the Medipasia, which is likened to a bear. It doesn't mean that the kingdom is the kingdom of bears, but it is likened to a bear. The third one is the Greece, which is likened to a leopard. Then we come to the fourth kingdom, which is the main cream and the key issue of our lesson, which is pagan Rome, which is likened to the four beasts. Again, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the beast are symbolic. Now, pagan Rome, which is the fourth beast, later became papal Rome. Now, what is papal Rome? During pagan Rome, there were, there were ten kingdoms, and one of the kingdoms was papal was pa was pagan Rome, pagan Rome, which later became papal Rome, meaning papal Rome emerged as the little horn. Now, when we talk about the little horn, we are not talking about the horn in terms of literal a horn. The little horn. Let's ease a bit. What is the little horn? The little horn is the Pope, the Pope that we all know. The little horn is the Pope. In the previous lesson, it was explained as a horn which has eyes and it is dreadful, it looks terrible and all that. So as we move, we moved from pagan Rome which later became Papal Rome, and Papal Rome emerges as the little horn, and the little horn is the Pope. Now, this little horn leads us to Daniel 7 and 8. When we come to Daniel 7 and 8, we don't separate the two. Daniel 7 and 8 speak the same language. Daniel 7 and 8, scripture interprets itself as it was said in the previous lesson. So Daniel 7 and 8 have similarities. They go together and they speak language. So we don't separate Daniel 7 and 8. Daniel 7 and 8 leads us to describing what is the Pope. The Pope, again, it is, Pope is likened to a horn. It doesn't mean that the Pope is, is the horn. 
Now, the Pope has powers. What powers are we talking about? Powers of persecution. And we know that the Pope also is self-exalting. The Pope wants uh, people to, to worship him and to adore him as if he is God. And he is not God. So that element of self-exalting, which leads us away from that because the devil was sent out of heaven because of pride and the Pope goes the same line of self-exaltation. And also, the characteristic of the Pope, his main duty is to target the Christians and persecute the Christians. Remember, in the old time of age, the Pope did persecute, kill, and, and, and slaughter uh, martyrs of our faith the likes of uh, John Wesley and the Martin Luther. And we know that in the Pope's character, he will supernaturally be destroyed by the kingdom that will last forever and ever, the one and only kingdom, which is God's kingdom. Now, during the time of Reformation, the Pope had slaughtered killed and persecuted the protestants together with the martyrs of our faith and the pope was arrested for for what he did and that was in the period of 1798 when he was imprisoned for killing and persecuting god's children again our main focal point is that the pope had powers to change laws and the times at, at, at that period. Hence now we have a Sabbath which was uh, tempered with, hence people are worshipping on the first day of the week. That is the change of times that we are talking about. Now, again, we ask ourselves that the Pope is working towards regaining his power. Now, which powers are we talking about? The powers that we are talking about is the powers of changing laws and changing times. And at the time we are with now, we need to ask ourselves that, what is this statement saying? Times are going to be changed and laws are going to be changed look at the way we are worshiping right now and apply your mind what does that mean therefore last time the last time the pope had powers was in 19 was in 1798 now do you think the pope has given up on not having his powers back or the pope is working towards having his powers back Yes, he will be given his powers back. The time is coming. Hence, we are talking about time. We need to figure it out for ourselves. Where are we in terms of that? Has that prophecy been fulfilled? Yes or no? Now, the question here is, when the Pope gets back his powers, what will he do? Will he repeat what he did to John Haas and other Protestants? Will he persecute God's children? Will he speak blasphemous words against God? That's a question we need to be asking ourselves. Are we headed to a time where Christians will be persecuted for having a different belief to that of the Pope? Where is your heart? Where are you? Do you understand prophecy? Which time are we in terms of prophecy? May the good Lord bless you and keep you. Let us continue reading Daniel 2, Daniel 7 and 8 for more emphasis of today's lesson. May the good Lord bless you and keep you. Let's pray. Our God and our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for granting us an opportunity to share your word once more. May all that we have spoken, Lord, 
open our hearts and let your word have a special place in it. Give us a clean heart, Lord, so that we can be receptive to your word. And may it change us and may we be ready for what is to come or what will happen to us. May we know our ground and our foundation, Lord, that when it is time to stand for your word, we can do justice to that because we know that you died for us in the cross. And therefore, Father, we ask you that you give, you give us the strength that we need at all times. We know that on our own, we are not going to be able to make it, but through the assistance of the Holy Spirit, we can make it. And above all, may you give us the strength, Lord, so that we can make it finally to your kingdom, that when you come in your clouds of glory, we may our names be found written in the book of life. We ask all this, Lord, and the forgiveness of our sins, and may we, you grant us the peace that surpasses all understanding on your holy day, the Sabbath. We ask you to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.